are these people? If only, if only the media like would have talked about some of this stuff, you know. If only they did that. Mm -hmm. um, which brings us to your story. This brings us to our story. So, uh, fun fact: uh, May fourth um, is known as Star Wars Day uh, yeah. in pop pop culture, uh, but. It's also known as World Press Freedom Day. Yep. So uh, you like how they cover that. Actually you like how they cover that. that up, huh? World Press Freedom Day is right. now Star Wars Day. You know, nothing right. like a, a yeah. fucking <laughs> cash cash grabbing <laughs> capitalist fucking movie that even Mel Brooks made fun of the fact that that's what we, you know, selling right. toys to children. Uh -oh. Um, so, uh, so we're going to look at so we're going to look at journal journalist uh, Jonathan Cook, uh, who is based in the UK. Uh, he went to a protest in Bristol, um, where he did a speech there, and he spoke. Uh, so this segment is based upon the speech that he just, um, you know, uh, he basically used his speech as a Substack article. So. Uh, shout out to Indy, who loves Substack, uh, mm -hmm. trying to get enough independent uh, writers on coming to a in the space Substack newsletter near you. Thank you. I was waiting for that. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I felt like it was just giving, uh, especially an independent journalist, a platform and highlighting his work. Um, but before we do that, let's take a look at this protest in Bristol. I believe this was done. In, I'm not sure if it was done this past weekend. It could have been, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, but you will see Jonathan Cook in this. Um, so he's gonna. So we're gonna talk about uh, the media bias uh, regarding uh, the Gaza protests, and then we'll get into uh, his article itself. So. Uh, so we no, no. This playing this. Yeah, can you, yeah, you can play the whole thing. This march um, is themed around the media bias and the coverage of what's happening in Gaza right now, the genocide in Gaza right now. But it's also about the murder of the of the journalists on the ground um, and everything that's being done to obstruct the truth, which is really quite simple. What we have here is a colonizing power and enacting oppression in just another way on the people trying to ethnic cleanse from the land that is natively theirs. So that's what we're protesting today. And it's so important because what the media reports is so much more than just some words. They have so much power, power in making us complacent power in making us accept that some humans are less deserving of life than others, that this is self-defense or necessary, um, and in obscuring the context that you need in order to understand what's happening in Gaza right now. Western media is enabling genocide by the way they're framing the conflict in, in Palestine. This is a genocide and we're not allowed to even say the word genocide. Um, the, the, the Israeli media, the Israeli representatives, can come out and say whatever they want and it, they're left unchallenged. And as soon as somebody from the Palestinian side comes out and uh, talks about what's going on, they're questioned, they're interrogated, they're like they're put on trial and it's absolutely outrageous what's going on. You know there was a survey done a few years ago, a few decades ago, that people who saw the BBC coverage of the conflict in Palestine, they believed the Palestinians were occupying Israel. That is just shocking. So here we are today, fantastic turnout, and people are talking about how they are aware of the bias. The problem with the British media is it's not giving us, it's omitting huge amounts of information about what's going on. It's refusing to describe what's happening as a genocide, and it clearly is, characterised in that way. <clears throat> it's applying double standards, double standards compared even to the recent uh, invasion of Ukraine where it was clear that the BBC was quite prepared to take a stand on what it saw as war crimes and atrocities and yet when Israel is doing far worse things 
in Gaza, it refuses to identify those things and using the same kind of language. So it's burying the story. Um, and it's also focusing on us as activists who are trying to highlight what's going on, uh, to bring the message, to make the genocide visible. It, what you can see is the, the reluctance to report it. So, for instance, the mass graves in Khan Yunis and, uh, the, that are being discovered actually across Gaza as the Israeli army has withdrawn from certain areas. Is the media giving this any kind of centre stage? Or they took days and days even to mention it. And it's just it was mentioned briefly and then disappeared. So you can't say it's not reported. I think that's important for the Western media not to feel that they, they can be pointed out that they're just uh, totally failing to report things. What they tend to do is just minimise it or show it to the margins or report on it in the, in the least way they can or equivocate about it or deflect from it so it becomes retaliation even though Israel can't retaliate against Palestinians they've been occupying them for decades and decades Lovely. All right. So, you know, so Jonathan shared a little bit of the media bias that is had. I mean, we've talked about it extensively on this show. I know you, you and Indy have talked about it on How We Missed That as well. Mm -hmm. um, so let's get into his article. Like I said, he just took his speech and transcribed it into this. Okay. Um, so he writes, why the media have failed Gaza? The media's job is to create the impression of uncertainty, doubt, and confusion. Our job is to explode that lie, denying them and the political class they protect an alibi. So Jonathan uh, writes, and yeah, Indy mentioned that he is an Indy Media Award of Honorary. Uh, Thank you. So yesterday, May 4th, was World Press Freedom Day. And it is fitting we mark it by highlighting two things. First, we should honor the brave journalists of Gaza who have paid a horrifying price for making the Palestinian experience of genocide visible to Western audiences over the past seven months. Israel has killed a tenth of their number, some 100 journalists, as it tries to prevent the truth of its atrocities from getting out. Israel has been the most deadly eruption of violence against journalists ever recorded. Second, we must shame the Western media, not least the BBC, who have so utterly betrayed their Palestinian colleagues by failing to properly report the destruction of Gaza or name it as a genocide. The BBC aired only the briefest coverage of South Africa's devastating case against Israel at the ICJ in January, a case so powerful the court has put Israel on trial for genocide, a fact you would barely know from the BBC's reporting. By contrast, the corporation cleared the schedules to present in full Israel's hollow legal response. The BBC's double standards are all the more glaring if how it reported Ukraine, also invaded by a hostile army, rushes. One, two, only two years ago, the BBC dedicated its main news headlines to Kyiv's mass citizens mass producing Molotov cocktails which was to great Russian soldiers closing in on their city. BBC East Middle East editor Jeremy Bowen felt emboldened to pose, apparently approvingly, a diagram showing weak points where the improvised explosives would do the most damage to Russian tanks and the soldiers inside. Two years later, in his coverage of Israel's assault on Gaza, the same BBC has performed a 180-degree turn. It is quite impossible to imagine Bowen or any other British journalist posting instructions of how Palestinians might burn alive Israeli soldiers in their tanks, even though those soldiers, unlike Russia's, have been co-occupying and stealing Palestinian lands for decades, not two years. Israeli soldiers, unlike Russian soldiers, are now actively enforcing a genocidal policy of starvation. But the double standards of establishment media like the BBC aren't directed only towards the peace of Gaza. They're directed at us, the public, too. The same media that celebrated families taking in Ukraine refugees 
as willing conspired in the smearing of those whose only crime is that they wish to stop the slaughter of 15,000 plus Palestinian children in Gaza. There is apparently nothing heroic about opposing Israel's genocide, even if opposing Russia's invasion is still treated as a badge of honor. Mm -hmm. The media gives politicians a free pass to vilify as an anti-Semite anyone outraged at UK weapons are being used to help kill, maim, and orphan many, many tens of thousands of Palestinian children. That accusation assumes that every Jew supports the slaughter and erases all those Jews standing alongside us today at this protest. In the U.S., police forces are beating and arresting students have peacefully called on their universities to stop investing in the arming of Israel's genocide. When the police pulled back at UCLA, it was only to allow pro-Israel thugs to assault the students, again, many of them Jews. A clear war is being waged against the right to protest against a genocide. And in tandem, the media has declared war on the English language. The roles of aggressor and victim have been reversed. The BBC accused the students encamped on the university grounds of clashing with pro-Israel groups that invaded the campus to violently attack them. What explains these glaring inconsistencies, this gigantic failure by a media that's supposed to act as a watchdog on the abuse of power? Part of the answer is old school racism. Ukrainians look like us, as some reporters let slip, and therefore deserve our solidarity. Palestinians, it seems, do not. But there is another more important answer. The establishment media isn't really a watchdog on the abuse of power. It never was. It is a narrative factory there to create stories that make those abuses of power possible. State and billion-owned media achieve this goal through various sleights of hand. First, they omit stories that might disrupt the core narrative. The media script is a simple one. What the West and its allies do is always well-meant, however horrific the outcomes. And what the West does, however provocative or foolhardy, can never be cited as an explanation for what our enemies do. No cause and no effect. They, whoever we select, are simply savage. They are evil. They are out to destroy civilization. They must be stopped. Nightly for weeks, I've watched the BBC News. If it were all I re relied on, I would barely know that Israel is daily bombing the refugee camps of Rafa that are supposedly a safe zone. Or that Israel continues to engineer a famine by and that Palestinians continue to die of hunger. Or that the UK has actively assisted the creation of that famine by denying UNWA funding. Or that the protests to end the Gaza genocide, painted as terror supporting an anti-Semitic, are backed by many, many Jews, some of them here today. And of course, I would have little idea that Israel's imprisonment and slaughter of Palestinians did not begin on October 7th with Hamas's attack. That's because the BBC continues to ignore the siege of Gaza as a context for October 7th, just as, just as, it, just as it and the rest of the media largely ignore the 17-year siege throughout the years Israel was enforcing it. If I relied on the BBC, I would not understand what, that what Israel is doing can neither be retaliation, not a war. You can't go to war or retaliate against a people whose territory you have been belligerently occupying and stealing for decades. And when the media can no longer admit, it distracts through strategies of deflection, misdirection, and mimicimination. So when Gaza makes the news, as it really does now, it is invariably filtered through other lenses. Minimization. The focus is on. Was. Thank you. No. The focus <laughs> is on interminable negotiation, on Israel's plans for the day after, on the agonies of the hostages' families, on the fears evoked by protest chants, protest chants, on where to draw the line on free speech. Anything to avoid addressing a genocide that has been carried out in broad day for seven months. In their defense, establishment journalists tell us that they have a duty to be impartial. Their critics, they say, do not understand how news operations work. 
As a journalist who spent years working in major newsrooms, I can assure you this is a self-serving lie. Just this week, an interview went viral of the Nor Broadcasting Corporation interviewing Israeli government spokesman David Menser. Unlike the BBC, Menser's lies did not pass on challenge. The Norwegian journalist spent 25 minutes on picking his falsehoods and deceptions one by one. It was revelatory to see an Israeli spokesman claims stripped away layer by layer until he stood there naked, his lies exposed. We should have pulled, I should have pulled that, honestly, if I could have find, found that. It can be done if there is a will to do it. Journalists at the BBC and the rest of the establishment media understand, however implicitly, that their job is to fail. It is to fail to investigate the genocide in Gaza. It is to fail to give voice to the powerless. It is to fail to promote, to provide context and aid understanding. It is to fail to show solidarity with their colleagues in Gaza being killed for their journalism. Rather, the BBC's role is to protect the political establishment from ever being held to account for their complicity in genocide. The establishment media's job is to create the impression of uncertainty, of doubt, of confusion, even when what is happening is crystal clear. When one day the world court finally gets around to issuing a ruling on Israel's genocide, probably God knows how long it's going to be, our politicians and media will claim they could not have known that they were misled, that they could not clearly see because events were shrouded by the fog of war. Our job is to explode that lie to deny them an alibi. It is to keep pointing out that the information was there from the start. They knew, if only because we told them. And one day, if there is justice, any justice, they will stand in the dock at The Hague, their excuses stripped away. Hopefully. <sighs> any thoughts? Well, I think we're going to get to one of the reasons in, in a bit about why the media is failing. You know, but right. um, right. yeah, I mean, it's 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 not an accident. It is on purpose. You know, like mm -hmm. I, I I think that Kate hey, Cook makes that clear here that like you it may seem like an accident. It's not. If all these mistakes are going in one direction, clearly there's a a problem. You know, right. so. And it's and it's been happening. It's been in every war conflict we've been in. The media has been on board for it. So, yeah, I I think it's you know par for the course. Unfortunately, you know. So, and I mean, it's one of the reasons that places like us are demonetized. It's one of the reasons why. Many of our brothers and sisters are suppressed and demonetized. So, yeah, I mean, like, it's very clear to me how that shit's working. So, but speaking of demonetizing, you got to do this if you want to support us now. You got to go to kodashv.com slash Indie News Network since YouTube doesn't want, you know, for you to be able to give us super chats. So, you can do it this way by scanning the QR code on your screen. You can do it that way. Or if you're in the live chat, you can put exclamation mark donate. You get a little link to take you over there. If you can't give monetarily, don't forget to like and subscribe, hit and share, you know, commenting. Tell us what you think. You know, let us know. We'd love to hear it. So, you know, you can also go to other platforms by going to anynews.network and following the links to Rockfin and Rumble.